uh, and welcome. Um, welcome to what I think of as our good news webinar. Um, and we need it in the midst of uh, the current pandemic. Uh, the coronavirus has punched a hole in the global economy, leaving millions unemployed. Yes, the climate crisis is already with us, but the good news is that technology can help enable a global transition to clean energy. And it isn't just in Europe uh, that they're using this crisis as an opportunity to shift policies to address climate. States in the United States are doing this as well, despite the Trump administration's efforts to roll back clean regulation. And they're showing how federal government-led investment could deploy this technology and spur a sustainable recovery. So we are really delighted today uh, at the Digital Innovation and Democracy Initiative at the German Marshall Fund to host two leaders in this field, uh, Reed Hunt and Dave Hayes, who will go through presentations for the first half of this webinar. Uh, we're gonna ask you to submit questions through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen um, and not the chat function. And I'll sift through them for after the two presentations. Let me just do a quick intro of our two uh, leaders and uh, they will uh, then take over and give you some great news. Uh, Reed Hunt uh, knows what he speaks. He's the former chairman of the Federal Communications Commission. He oversaw the key regulatory decisions that led to the widespread deployment of broadband, internet, mobile phones, and other technologies we're all relying on today as we work from home. He's the uh, founder and CEO of the Coalition for Green Capital, which is a nonprofit with a mission to halt climate change uh, by accelerating investment in clean technologies. Dave Hayes uh, served as the Deputy Secretary at the U.S. Department of the Interior for both President Obama and President Clinton. He now leads the State Energy and Environmental Impact Center at NYU School of Law, which supports state attorneys general in their advocacy for clean energy policies. So these are the two uh, people that we want to hear from on this topic. We're going to start with Dave Hayes. Uh, Dave, we would love to hear this good news. <laughs> Please tell us how are progressive states uh, fighting against the rollbacks of the green regulations and what is the status of green tech support at both the federal and state levels? And then we'll turn it over to Reed to hear about what a green bank could do. And thank you all for joining us. Well, thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, good morning. Um, our topic, as Karen explained, focuses on government-led investment in clean technology and how it can speed the transition to clean energy and spur a sustainable recovery. Now, it may seem odd that a lawyer is opening up this discussion, uh, but as we'll see, lawyers and other advocates are, are playing a central role right now in helping to lead the green tech revolution in the U.S. Their role is first, as Karen alluded to, to blunt efforts by the current federal administration to retard the clean energy transition by promoting fossil fuel based energy, including in particular by rolling back regulations that restrict carbon and methane emissions from fossil fuels. And second, lawyers and other advocates are working in a large number of progressive states in the US to write new laws and policies that are accelerating clean tech. I'm going to lay out this frame over the next few minutes, laying the groundwork for my friend uh, and colleague Reed Hunt's discussion of how green banks that have uh, been successfully operating at the state and local level may go national, providing a government financing tool that can leverage private capital to turbocharge investments in green tech. Uh, but back to lawyers and the current scene in the U.S. and the energy world, uh, let me share my screen and show some slides here. Um, so uh, first, a, a word about uh, the State Energy and Environmental Impact Center. Um, at, at the, uh, one second here. Our, our mission uh, is to support state attorneys general in defending and promoting clean energy, climate, and environmental laws and policies. Uh, we support all state attorneys general that are taking progressive views on these issues. Uh, the state AGs have been extraordinarily busy uh, since the beginning of the Trump administration. And you can see that the, the black bars uh, are on climate change related activities and the yellow bars on, are on clean energy and energy efficiency related actions. 
if you look at our report from last December, these total over 300 separate actions on all of these environmental clean energy and climate uh, issues with climate and clean energy dominating uh, the agenda for the progressive clean, uh, attorney generals in the states referenced uh, below. Uh, in terms of, of clean tech, uh, you know there are important drivers in the US that are pushing toward clean tech. There's obviously uh, societal uh, uh, pressure that we're, we are still in, coalition that formed uh, early in the administration after the Trump administration uh, announced that it was withdrawing from Paris. Uh, 19 state attorneys general, many governors, uh, uh, hundreds of NGOs, mayors, et cetera, uh, uh, all uh, uh, committed to conform to the Paris uh, requirements and to push forward on clean energy. In the investor community, organizations like Ceres and others are, are pushing for sustainability, a uh, lot of attention on uh, the investor community in that regard. There's also societal pressure from effective uh, clean energy advocates like Vote Solar, uh, who are in the states, in the local uh, uh, communities, and, and pressing Congress uh, for uh, continued progress on the clean energy side. I'm gonna focus mostly though here on the legal pressure toward clean energy and clean tech. We have a number of federal mandates that were put in place by the uh, prior administration uh, I say it, currently these federal mandates are an outlier because the current administration uh, is uh, not disposed to implement or enforce them. Uh, and those include in particular reductions on greenhouse gases under the Clean Air Act, and also the energy efficiency equipment standards that are laid out uh, for the Department of Energy's very successful program. Uh, then I'll turn to state mandates where the good news uh, is, is primarily uh, located here. Uh, and I think the state level uh, push for clean energy uh, is illustrative of the societal pressures that we're seeing as, uh, as a whole and that Reed will be helping to provide more uh, context about. Um, so I wanna just set the stage for the federal mandates. Um, this is a familiar chart to many that just demonstrate the fact that power sector slash electricity uh, transportation and and industrial emissions are the uh, the the large uh, the largest segments of emissions uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. And so, when the the Obama administration took on the the for the first time uh, regulating greenhouse gases uh, from the uh, 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 in the U.S., they focused on these three sectors. Uh, this was primarily in the second term. Uh, although in the, the, it started in the first term with the auto sector, very significant reductions mandated and agreed to by the state of California and by the major auto manufacturers, the power sector with the clean power plan and the oil and gas sector uh, focusing on methane emissions. Uh, so here's what's happened uh, on, on all three of these major initiatives. Uh, the bottom line story that I'm about to tell is that it has taken four years to get to this point uh, by the uh, Trump administration, the this point being uh, very fresh final new rules that the state attorneys general who have been fighting these are confident have very serious legal defects. And in any event, will have very shallow roots, if any roots at all, uh, by the end of this year. So the Obama car rule, as I just alluded to before, was a first term initiative that, that required major fuel economy increases on a year by year basis uh, through, the uh, through uh, 2025, 2026. And it approved a, a waiver for California uh, to, uh, 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 to, to agree to those same emissions, plus uh, supplement it with their zero emission vehicle program that required mandated uh, 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 significant sales of, of electric vehicles in the state. Uh, the Trump administration has tried to roll this back. Uh, they, they split it into two. They revoked the California waiver last September. Uh, that's now in litigation. Briefs are being filed uh, literally as we speak. Uh, the the ma major amicus briefs went in on Monday. Um, 
And then the final rule didn't come out, the one that actually rolls back the fuel economy standards very significantly, that didn't come out until, uh, until March. Uh, so litigation was immediately filed by state attorneys general. This will not be briefed and no decision will be made on this rule for many months. Um, similar story on the power sector, the, the uh, Clean Power Plan final rule was published in August 2015. Uh, the uh, Affordable Care Act uh, 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 a misnamed rule uh, by, by Trump uh, took some time to get in place. It was not published until June 2019. Uh, appellate court, court briefs are still being filed. No uh, oral argument has yet been, uh, uh, been scheduled. Uh, and the state attorney generals believe that the uh, legal basis for uh, the far more restrictive uh, rule uh, that in fact would increase emissions from the power sector uh, 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 have some serious legal defects. And then in the oil and gas sector, we're still waiting for uh, a, an expected repeal of the uh, methane emissions reductions required uh, by the Obama administration's uh, new source performance standard under the Clean Air Act. Um, so, and that, that repeal is expected to literally uh, uh, take away any federal authority to reduce methane emissions from the oil and gas sector, despite uh, more and more evidence coming out uh, that uh, methane emissions are, are, are a significant problem from the oil and gas sector. Again, we think that this rule, uh, which is not yet final, uh, will, will hit legal headwinds uh, led by state AGs. So um, the bottom line as we move to the state level is that while it is true that this administration has been negative on greenhouse gas emissions, pro uh, fossil fuel oriented uh, energy, uh, their efforts to dismantle the architecture under the Clean Air Act that requires emissions reductions is very much uh, a work in progress and a, um, uh, I would say, a defective work in progress. Uh, moving to the state level, um, this is where a huge amount of the action is. And for those of you um, who are tuning in from abroad, you may be surprised to know or to learn that uh, the states have an, uh, in the U.S. have enormous authority over uh, the electricity sector in particular. Uh, the Federal Power Act uh, looks to states uh, as having essentially virtually plenary authority to decide what they want to, their shape of their electricity sector to look like. So states can, can decide that they want, for example, a large proportion of their electricity to come from clean energy sources. And that's what a majority of states already are requiring, which is what in fact has been fueling the increase along, uh, in wind and solar energy, et cetera, through renewable portfolio standards. Also a recent innovation uh, caused by major states that have uh, rely a lot on zero carbon nuclear energy, including Illinois, New York, and New Jersey. They have a credit program that subsidizes nuclear to keep it operating uh, long enough to uh, facilitate the transition uh, to other clean energy sources. And, and there's a huge amount of activity in offshore wind uh, 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 off the Atlantic coast in the Northeast where the wind resource is fantastic. And again, states are driving it. States are mandating that their utilities buy that now expensive offshore wind and put it in their rate base. Uh, and that's, that's what is fueling the contracts that have been signed uh, up and down the East Coast for offshore wind. That industry is about to take off because of this state activity. Also, uh, the distribution system is the province of state, state regulated utilities. For many years, a number of them have been pushing energy efficiency requirements, uh, significant ones, and, and uh, there's a energy efficiency uh, standard approach that, is, uh, that many state legislatures are, are taking up that, that include, in addition to short-term energy efficiency uh, work, longer-term goals that utilities must meet to increase their, their efficiency. 
And of course, there's been a revolution in, in terms of distributed energy in the US with many states uh, uh, facilitating rooftop solar, microgrids, and other uh, energy, uh, other uh, 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 ways to have customers participate uh, in, in, uh, in energy, in creating energy. Uh, this, this chart illustrates the amazing a number of states that are, are leaning into this in terms of clean electricity commitments. You have, at 2018, California 100% by 2045. And then look at that right column. This is all last year to give a sense of the tsunami of interest at the state level in clean electricity. Uh, the, 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 those, uh, those first four are by executive order. Starting from Colorado on down, those are state legislatures that have mandated these uh, requirements. With New York on 100% by 2040, uh, putting them in the pole position here uh, to, uh, to, to lead the way. Um, so, and my final slide is, to, is in addition to talking about the electricity sector, uh, a number of state-led uh, activities are looking for broad-based greenhouse gas uh, emissions reductions across uh, across sectors and in the in the uh, in California across the entire state with their carbon cap and trade program. Uh, importantly, that program throws off a lot of money uh, as companies buy allowances to enable them to do business in California. Some of that money is going into clean tech. Uh, uh, clean buildings, uh, 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 energy efficiency, et cetera. And in the Northeast US, you have a dozen or so states participating in the REGI, the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, which is a cap and invest program where there's a cap uh, that on the power sector and then the allowances that generate funds go largely into clean tech. So you've got states that are putting real money uh, into, into uh, clean tech. On the transportation side, there's a lot of activity. Uh, you have in the West Coast, Oregon and California with a low carbon fuel standard that's creating a performance standard that is pushing for uh, uh, increased um, electrification and, uh, and other uh, fuel benefits uh, in, across their transportation sector. Um, we talked about the California waiver a couple of minutes ago in the federal context where California has its own zero emission vehicle requirements that it has just last week proposed to extend significantly uh, to large trucks. Um, and importantly, that's not just a California program, but under the Clean Air Act, under Section 177, any state that follows the, clean, the, the California lead under the Clean Air Act uh, and the California waiver uh, can, uh, can uh, uh, have the same requirements. And we have more and more states uh, signing up for Section 177. Uh, uh, and now nearly half of the entire auto fleet in the US uh, is covered under the Clean Air Act. So that shows what the stakes, how high the stakes are in terms of the California waiver uh, litigation that I mentioned is, is ongoing. But we are, we are confident that uh, California will win out on that, uh, which means California plus a dozen other, the largest states with the most vehicles in the US. Finally, Transportation Climate Initiative has been formed in the New England and Mid-Atlantic states uh, based on the Reggie success, a notion of, of getting together and, and, and putting a cap on transmission emissions uh, on a regional basis. That's in its early stages, but again, is illustrative of the, of the state-based activity. Finally, a number of states are taking on uh, building codes and building requirements, both for energy efficiency and for, for clean energy. Um, a lot of activity there, financed to some extent by some of the, the cap and trade and cap and invest programs uh, and local initiatives by mayors as well as governors. So I'll, uh, I'll end there and, uh, and turn this over to Reed. That was so great, Dave. Thank you very much. And Reed, please give us some more good news. Tell us what a green bank can do. Okay, thank you. Um, so I hit share screen and um, my slides right there. 
And uh, you want me to hit slideshow, right? Zoom. Did I get, is that, well, I don't, we probably want to start at one. Is that okay, Karen and, and everybody? Perfect. Okay. So, um, so my dear friend and, and, and colleague and buddy, uh, Dave, has explained to you um, uh, what you can do if you have a lot of get up and go and start a whole new institution, a whole team of lawyers uh, to um, try to uh, thwart uh, the uh, goal of uh, this administration. Um, you know, let's put it in the big picture context. This administration uh, looked at a complex array of uh, statutes and uh, regulations that are intended to facilitate uh, quickly the switch from carbon to clean. It looked at that array and said, let's try to uh, twist them all uh, to produce the opposite result, to stop the switch from uh, carbon to clean and to um, elevate the, the uh, significance of the carbon industry in the domestic and global economy. And it had its um, it's had its international counterpart. So what David has explained is how you try to uh, use our federalism, our system of uh, state jurisdictions, and our administrative process and our judiciary to try to at least uh, uh, thwart the uh, desire of the administration to produce the opposite result than the intent of of. Uh, these statutes and these statutes have decades of uh, precedent and experience behind them. What I'm going to talk about is assuming a new administration that wanted the switch from carbon to clean and wanted uh, it to happen quickly. How could we make it uh, make it be the case that the switch from carbon to clean is politically popular satisfies a uh, 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 environmental justice goals uh, and can be done very, very quickly because uh, there's not a moment to lose in reducing the uh, volume of greenhouse gas uh, uh, that is emitted from the sectors that David explained to you. So this is how do you put the uh, pedal to the metal? How do you accelerate? And accelerator, as you'll see on the slides, is the name that the House gave to the institution that 11 years ago in conversation uh, with the stimulus of 2009, well, we uh, called a green bank. Uh, so the House uh, last week um, took uh, a, uh, a bill introduced in the Senate by Senator Markey and Senator Van Hollen and in the House by Congresswoman Dingell called the National Climate Bank. They renamed it the Clean Energy and sustainability accelerator and said that it should get a deposit of $20 billion. Uh, we now uh, know that we cannot climb Mount McConnell because he is not uh, likely uh, to agree with this since he is a uh, champion of the uh, continued uh, existence of the old uh, carbon industry. Uh, but the House bill is a basis for, uh, we hope, negotiation with him over the next trillion dollar uh, economic stimulus package. Uh, we also hope that it is the blueprint uh, for the Biden administration uh, plans. Uh, and uh, we hope that uh, if the political climate uh, changes uh, in the green direction, uh, that uh, that House bill uh, will be uh, um, passed in uh, January or February of next year. So that's the political setup. Uh, um, I'm going to make two points here. The first is that uh, there's been a rather amazing shift in public opinion over the last decade, which actually the Trump administration has uh, helped by its jihad against uh, uh, clean power and against uh, the green agenda, because they've elevated the attention uh, and all the efforts that David and his group have made have elevated the tension. So the shift now is that uh, climate denialism is over. Uh, four fifths of the country say a major crisis or a real problem is the way to describe uh, climate change. And I just want to point out uh, that at the bottom here, you see the Republican number 
and we're only now looking at 35% uh, of Republicans, only a third of Republicans think that the climate uh, change is either overblown or a hoax. This is where uh, Donald Trump is. He occupies a position that is somewhere between the hoax and overblown. Uh, so his faction represents only one third of Republicans, only 18% of independents, only 3% of Democrats, and only 17% of the whole country. That's a minority rule that we're seeing in the executive branch. Um, this same uh, polling has been done in the swing states. You get the same results in the swing states. This is also new news about popularity. Uh, the swing states have always been uh, anxiety producing for um, people with a, uh, in politics with a green agenda, meaning maybe, maybe everybody in California agrees, maybe everybody in New York agrees, but what about uh, in Michigan and in Pennsylvania? And the answer is now the clean energy agenda is very, very popular in the swing states. And uh, this poll shows uh, the results in the frontline districts of the Democratic congressional uh, campaign, uh, meaning these are the swing districts for control of the House. And uh, here again, you see uh, very high levels of popularity for this question here in the italics and the gray. Do you think the United States government should pass a law that deposits $35 billion in a nonpartisan nonprofit fund that would create 5 million new jobs in clean energy? This is the Green Bank, a nonpartisan nonprofit fund that would create 5 million uh, new jobs. Uh, the response of uh, Senator McConnell and the Republicans in the Senate has been the following. Job creation has nothing to do with clean energy. For you to be talking about clean energy is extraneous and you're just trying to quote, take advantage unquote of the need to create new jobs. You're just trying to be quote, opportunistic unquote. But in fact, the American people don't agree. They do want new jobs created and they want them created uh, in sectors that are part of doing the right thing. And they want people to be able to uh, look for work in uh, jobs that um, maybe we could call them honorable or productive. In fact, um, it turns out that the American people very, very much support job creation in all infrastructure. These are the five basic platforms that undergird uh, a modern society, the communication, sewage, water, transportation, and clean energy platforms. And the voter support for job creation in all of them is uh, statistically uh, the same. Now what I'm gonna do, because this is the uh, fast learning group, uh, I'm gonna explain exactly what a accelerator or a national green bank would do in one particular situation. This is one of a set of about uh, a dozen use cases that we have developed. Uh, and the point here is that the intervention of a national climate uh, bank or an accelerator, the intervention in transportation is going to look differently than the intervention in energy efficiency in homes is going to look different uh, from the intervention in long haul transmission. Um, but we don't have time to go over all of them and, and one will suffice to show the need for intervention. Okay, so uh, uh, don't be intimidated by the chart because it's going to turn out that you're going to really enjoy learning about this. Here's the coal facility. It's uh, pumping out uh, 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 greenhouse gases. It's, uh, it's burning coal in order to generate electricity. This is a real case. I have uh, taken out the names of the companies to protect the innocent, but this is a real case in a uh, Western uh, state. Uh, this is a uh, co-op, which is a common way uh, to organize the electricity industry, uh, particularly in the West. And so it has a uh, long time ago um, um, funded and built and it owns this uh, coal fired uh, boiler and it has transmission infrastructure, meaning lines from this place to wherever the electricity is supposed to be used. And this is a generation company, which is different than the company that owns right here in blue, the electric grid, the lines that reach your house. So this generation company sells to the electric grid company. They might be the same company in some places, they might be different, but they're obviously different functions. 
And then over here, the electricity, which is coal fired, moves over to the rural utility uh, customers. Now, uh, this contract here between the uh, uh, cooperative utility, the distribution utility, the electric grid, this contract uh, with the generation company is long term, will buy your power for a long time. And that in turn means that the generation company has to keep providing that power and it's going to do it from its own owned facility. And the federal government can come in and say, okay, well, there's going to be a carbon tax, but that won't change the contract. The tax will just get passed on through the contract. Or the state government, as David said, can say, well, it's really, really important that you all, that everyone in the state that's generating electricity agree to have it be carbon neutral or, or no emissions uh, in 20 years. But this generation company is going to say, I think I'll wait to the very end of that time period because I've got this very long-term contract. So what do we do here to cause the switch from carbon to clean to be quick? And here's what we do. The National Climate Bank or the accelerator over here in the bottom left uh, loans money to a new company. It's called Nuco Wind. It's all in the green, green because this is the green story, right? And Nuco Wind uh, builds uh, or reaches a contract with somebody who has built a wind uh, farm. David said earlier that there's a tremendous number of uh, possible projects in offshore wind in the east, out in the west. Uh, there is a great deal of high country where there's a lot of wind. And so there are plenty of opportunities for a new co to invest in building these facilities. But the problem is we need a way to get this new wind company into this other story, which is the story on the right. Uh, so the answer is the new wind company gives money. See, it says exit financing, gives money to the a local utility. That local utility, you see it says exit fee payment, it pays the uh, cooperative power utility. That cooperative power utility turns around and it says to the workforce here, we're going to compensate you while we close this facility. We're going to find a way to not throw you out on the street because we don't want to increase unemployment. We want to facilitate a rapid transition so they're going to compensate the workers, and there's a variety of ways that that can be done. We won't get into that. It's not. It's uh, important to show how where the money will come from to do it. Right. So that closes the uh, facility here, and then the cooperative utility exits this business of being uh, generating uh, generating the electricity with the coal, but in order to of make sure that its shareholders or its owners uh, uh, are not resistant, there's a payment from the blue uh, to the red. So they're compensated for closing this down. And then meanwhile, the electricity now comes from the wind to the new co-wind and over to the distribution cooperative utility and then over to the rural utility. So there's a uh, no interruption in the electricity. The rural utility customers can keep the lights on at night. And here's the cost. So uh, the red is the price for coal electricity. Uh, we picked a 2016 number. I told you this is a real story. I just eliminated the name of the state. Uh, 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 and it will continue at this price or go up. In this particular case, the actual price for coal electricity was raised 13 times in the last 16 years, but we're just assuming that it would stay flat. And the green uh, shows us what actually happens uh, with the a price for renewable energy. It's a little bit higher for the, this time period here, the five years, we use 2016 because we have the statistics. You start at any point, you're gonna get the same looking chart it's a little bit higher because this is the exit fee payments. And as soon as they're all made, then you drop uh, to the actual uh, 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 price that reflects the cost of wind. What's behind all this is something you've all read, which is the uh, uh, levelized cost of wind power is lower than the price for coal electricity. This is big news, but what I've tried to show you 
is how you take advantage of that, compensate uh, uh, the workers and the companies that are locked into the coal facility and quickly introduce uh, the new uh, lower cost wind power. So we're doing this in order to create new jobs in uh, the wind sector, in order to benefit uh, the consumers by giving them a better deal, and in order to find a way to pay money uh, to the uh, few people that are operating that coal facility. It's not very many, uh, but we wanna make sure that they're not ignored or, 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 or rejected. And we're doing this in project after project after project because we're trying to find a way to create new jobs in the clean energy sector. These are the states hit hardest by clean energy job losses, just jobs within the clean energy sector. Uh, and they include uh, some critical states in terms of the uh, election result, uh, Michigan, uh, Florida, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Ohio. And so specifically, the National Green Bank would, uh, if it existed, go into those states and create new jobs in those states as well as in these other states where the election result is pretty much a foreordained. Uh, this firm here, Vivid, did an analysis of job creation. These are the numbers that you get. A $35 billion deposit in the National Climate Bank puts one out of, of, of four Americans who currently don't have work back to work. It accounts for about one-fourth of the making up of unemployment. Uh, there, these are the seven sectors that uh, this uh, accelerator or bank or fund would be engaged with. Uh, they are a very broad range. The big picture here is that there isn't any uh, single sector uh, to fix and then everything is fine. There are many sectors that have to be decarbonized. And uh, this is just a chart to show you that we've thought through how much money would be put in each of these sectors and we've analyzed the total job years. I'm just showing that we thought about it uh, and added up the five and a half million uh, uh, jobs by a from the ground up portfolio allocation. So I just wanted you to know that this is not just hand waving. We've actually uh, studied this pretty hard. And seven out of 10 voters specifically uh, want this, this green bank uh, to be created that will do these things. Thank you very much. Okay, that's, you've really given us a ton to work with here. Um, uh, first, just to connect the two presentations, Reed and Dave, let's say, let's jump ahead, say we have this accelerator. How does that work with the state strategies? Uh, this is happening at the federal level. Is there, is there state government interaction? Are these two things in parallel? Um, tell us how that works. Uh, do, with David, do you want to go? <laughs> no, you start first and I'll-, I'll Okay, I'll uh, so uh, if, let's say that you had a uh, carbon tax. That's very, very difficult to adjust on a state-by-state -state basis. It can be done, but it's difficult. Uh, I'm not saying it shouldn't exist. I'm just saying it's, an, it's a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say that you had a, um, let's say that you had a tax credit that's also difficult to adjust on a state-by-state -state basis. It's not to say we shouldn't have it, but it's difficult. The merit, uh, I think, uh, the unique merit of a national climate bank is that you're actually engaging in your intervention on a project-by-project -project basis, and that's why I showed you one specific concrete project. So consequently, you can go state by state, or as David said, you can go you know, uh, city by city and work with a mayor and look at each particular way in which we're going from carbon to clean and utterly complement whatever it is that that mayor or that state wanted to do if they were already pushing in the green direction. Plus, if you're talking about a state where the politics are such that they are not pushing in a green direction. What you're doing with the National Climate Bank is offering them a deal that they really don't want to refuse. Yeah. Yeah, and just to build on that, 
uh, I, to me, the, the genius of the National Climate Bank is that it's implemented at the state and local level uh, through uh, affiliates uh, that are in the community uh, and that and so the, the 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 easy play the layup if you will is for states like take New York for example very aggressive strategy they formed a new they, they passed a new law earlier this year that that ex will accelerate the intended to accelerate the siting of of uh, clean energy um, they are ready to go uh, and are and the entire state is is uh, infrastructure is ready to push for these projects. What's the major question? Financing. Uh, and the, the local green banks the, with the uh, backing of the National Climate Bank uh, can, uh, can fill that gap. Um, and, and as Reed mentioned, also the, the fact of leveraging private financing is going to make these projects more attractive to the more conservative states. Uh, because the, the role of government is limited. Uh, and in fact, of course, the, the idea of the National Bank is that this will not be a unit in the federal government. It's actually a nonprofit outside the federal government. Uh, so you don't have the, the playing of politics that we saw and the concerns and the, and the rhetoric around the, the DOE loan guarantee program that was highly successful in the early uh, Obama administration coming out of the uh, the Great uh, Recession, uh, but that, that, but that became politicized, uh, and uh, this 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 architecture uh, limits that possibility. That's, that's great. I, that would um, previews a question that I wanted to ask Reed about why it would be on the outside of the government rather than inside the government, and and I want to add a question from Ho Paul Hoffheins, who um, from Brussels, he runs the Lisbon Council, which is an independent think tank there. And he comments that in Europe, uh, they've had some similar initiatives that uh, have been captured by special interests, or at least that's the perception, and that there hasn't been a lot of change delivered. And so, Reed, can you talk to us about having something outside the government, and how do you have metrics and oversight to ensure that it's actually delivering what you want it to deliver? Well, uh what is the actual structure of the National Climate Bank? It is a nonprofit. Um, it is a 501c3. Well, we've already incorporated it, actually. It just needs the injection of capital. Uh, and um, the president would pick uh, the uh, initial board, but it would then perpetuate itself. Uh, if you want a model, it is something like uh, the Rockefeller Foundation or the Hewlett Foundation or some other uh, you know, well-known, long-standing foundation that has a charter and stuck to its mission and, uh, in fact, uh, you know, isn't able to uh, change that charter because the endowment, in our case, the public the deposit, in their case, you know, the Rockefellers or, the, or, or, or Mr. Hewlett himself, you know, created a legal structure that uh, can't be changed. Uh, what are we trying to uh, uh, avoid? We're trying to avoid the, what we're seeing right now, which is the politics uh, uh, turns and you have an administration come in that says, and I'll say this in an unsophisticated way, uh, well, the Clean Air Act means the Dirty Air Act or the clean, uh, in other words, that's what David is fighting against. And the notion that we're going to have political tussles to and fro, back and forth for the indefinite future, that, that's, that's, that's democracy, that's politics, uh, that's inevitable. The problem we're trying to solve is how to have a continuing long-term commitment to the change from uh, carbon to clean, because that is the only way to have it happen in a uh, timely manner that is quick enough to avoid uh, catastrophic uh, changes in the environment. So this nonprofit structure is designed uh, to do that. Uh, can uh, any institution be uh, captured by those that want to um, produce an opposite result? Yeah, I guess that's true, um, but you have to uh, take the risk of uh, trusting in some new institution creation in order to solve the problems that we have now, and we think this is a uh, this is a risk well worth taking. 
And how, how Dave, you know, how, how does this work with, um, with regulation? So you've been, you've been trying to protect old regulations, the intent of laws um, against uh, new regulations. What, what would you expect or what would you hope for um, if there was a renewed commitment to moving to clean energy, to green technology uh, in, uh, at the, in concert with a green bank? What kind of regulations would you want to see in addition or, or to, you know, to help ensure that it's, it's meeting its promise? Well, um, so I, I guess I, I have two different boxes here of types of regulations. We have environmental regulations, which are intended to ensure that projects of all stripes meet basic environmental uh, requirements. And, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that's the Clean Air Act, among others. Uh, and the, the Clean Air Act as, has now, as interpreted by the Supreme Court, concluded that, um, that because climate change presents a significant threat to human health and the environment, the Clean Air Act requires restrictions on greenhouse gases. So that's kind of a, a negative that, that, uh, that, that, that will burden the fossil fuel industry and provide more headroom for clean energy. Uh, so that's in terms of clean energy, that, that works very nicely with uh, a financing mechanism that will help this non-incumbent, largely non-incumbent industry get a foothold in a sector that has had traditional advantages and huge infrastructure for decades and decades and decades. Then you go over to the, uh, the energy laws and energy regulations. Yeah. Uh, many of them have been developed around the fossil fuel industry uh, and, uh, and, and uh, but, but interestingly, uh, the electricity sector is a good example. They have given a deep bow to states to do what they want to do. Uh, the, and uh, for reasons we've talked about here, having more financing to enable the progressive states to move toward clean energy is, is great. Also, I think that the proof of concept that, that Reed outlined, uh, that once that proof of concept is uh, socialized more broadly and the economic benefits of the cheaper energy and the cleaner energy are socialized, we're, we're, uh, my uh, hopefully not Pollyannish view is that these, these concepts of progressive states versus more conservative states will, will, uh, will not be relevant anymore. So uh, basically regulations should not be driving this uh, they can they can help uh, clear the way for this, but 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 I, I think frankly the the arguably the largest impediment right now to more deployment of clean energy is the finance side, and uh, and and uh, and so we have a very nice I think potential to marry some uh, regulatory reforms with uh, the financing. Uh, reforms that that uh, that Reed's discussed. That's great. So, Reed, I wanted to ask you about the jobs. Um, when you were talking about uh, people wanting jobs that had meaning, I was thinking of um, a new book that's out. Uh, Gene Sperling actually wrote a book about dignity. You know, we need to incorporate dignity into our economic thinking. Uh, and I'm, I'm, you know, there's been this whole subtext to the transition of our economy from manufacturing to service that people won't want to do some of these service jobs because they don't think of them as, and there's a whole gender component to that, you know, are they masculine enough, but also are they making things? Are they, or are they just hamburger flippers or just care, just caregivers? I, I want, I, I mean, I'm really intrigued by this idea that these are jobs with meaning. And so I want you to talk about that, but I also want you to talk about, are they good jobs? You know, can they pay well? Can they have benefits? Um, are they year round jobs? You know, can you, can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, thanks. Um, speaking of books, um, so, um, if we, if we weren't sheltering in California, uh, you know, I'd be back in Chevy Chase and I'd be able to do my hobby, which is rowing on the Potomac. Uh, there's a book about rowing, um, uh, that's well known in rowing circles called the boys in the boat. And it's the story of a, a, uh, 
a group of, of young people at the University of Washington in the middle of the Great Depression who, who had many different backgrounds. Basically, their common theme was that they didn't have any money and they were at a public university in the middle of the Great Depression. They came together you know, around rowing and achieved a world success. But how did they feed themselves? Uh, several of them went uh, to build the Grand Coulee Dam. And uh, that was, what was that, uh, four, three, four hundred miles east, I think. David, you've been there. I think it's three, four hundred miles east, something like that. So they went there in their old jalopy and they built the Grand Coulee Dam. Um, uh, it was outdoor work. If we had to put that in today's context, we would say this is about as safe uh, in terms of the virus as work that you can imagine. It was really well paid. People came from all over uh, the country. Uh, to do this. It took years uh, to complete this dam. Uh, and when you read the book, you feel, you can see that these, they were just so proud that they were electrifying at a very low cost, uh, the great Northwest. They weren't thinking it's clean energy, but they were really proud that they were paying their own way through life and that it gave them the freedom to get this good education and then also to do this rowing and end up going to England and winning, you know, and beating the, uh, well, you know, the, the Brits and, and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Big American patriotic story. But the core thing in there was the pride in being able to build something. And, um, you know, we don't have time, but, you know, I can go over sector after sector after sector and it's just, you can practically, uh, you know, if you have the gift for it, you can practically sing a song about, you know, uh, the building these different projects and changing uh, the world in, in all these different ways and being able to say, you know, uh, you know, hello, uh, kids, this is what I did. Because the transformation from where we are to where we need to be in the United States alone is $4 trillion of spending. That was $4 trillion, I said. <laughs> And that's, that means a lot of things that you can say, well, look, I put my initials in the wet concrete here, <laughs> right? That's a lot of things. And they're not just in one place. We're not talking about, you know, well, we'll just get California to do right and then everybody else will enjoy it, uh, a la, you know, a Silicon Valley startup. The, the beauty part of this is that the transformation from carbon to clean occurs in every building, in every electric grid, in every state, in every place that electricity is made, electricity is the uh, only commodity of which it can be said that almost all of it is made and used within a 200 mile radius. There's nothing else like that, not even milk, right? Uh, everything else, you know, is shipped vast distances, but that's not true of electricity for various physical reasons. So. I think it's a pretty inspiring when you look project by project by project in terms of the wage rates, it's much, much higher than uh, the average wages for service jobs. Uh, so that's a big step forward in terms of uh, closing the income inequality gap. $4 trillion goes a long way uh, to uh, improving the average wages in uh, uh, low to medium income households. Uh, there also, it's also a myth uh, to think that we're not talking about anything but, you know, people with jackhammers and uh, concrete pours. There's a vast range of uh, work that is involved in these projects, ranging from very sophisticated uh, software code to uh, complicated engineering problems being solved. Uh, it is also not true that there needs to be an immense amount of training. Uh, the software code can be written by the same people who otherwise were inventing TikTok or God knows what. Uh, so there's a very, very a big range of skills available in the economy. I want to dispel the myth that we have a skills gap. Uh, it's always better to have a more skilled economy, but we have the capability to, to fill these jobs. Uh, millions and millions of jobs, not in one day, uh, but over the course of the years uh, uh, will be created, but not double digit years. So I'll just, uh, let me just very briefly say, you know, 10 years, 20 years ago, when these concepts were being discussed in policy circles, when it was being debated with Larry Summers, whether we would or wouldn't have a green bank, and he said no, uh, 11 years ago. The problem then was uh, the actual intrinsic cost of the renewable power was not uh, lower than the carbon power. It is today. 
That is a big new fact, right? <laughs> Number two, the economists 10 and 20 years ago were very concerned about having the consumers pay more for the uh, output product in the middle yeah. of, for example, the um, uh, uh, dire circumstances of the uh, Great Recession, but now they have to pay less. I showed you that in the slides, right? Uh, so the, the big obstacles of 10 years and 20 years ago are not obstacles anymore. We do have obstacles. I showed them on the slides, but they boil down to the following. Let's not punish the consumers to get to a green economy. Let's not right. punish the set of workers to get to the green economy. Let's solve the problems by removing the obstacles and letting the capital flow. Most of it, as David said, will be private capital. So um, this, this is so much and it's so interesting and it's so hopeful. And we're gonna be putting this uh, entire discussion, uh, the recording of it online and we'll uh, make it available to everybody's here and we'll also tweet it out. Um, I'm sure uh, there are ways that we can uh, follow up with Dave and read. If you have questions, uh, you should feel free to email, email them to us and we'll get them uh, to them. But I want to give Dave uh, a chance to say any closing remarks after this. And uh, I think we're all inspired that maybe there's a win-win-win here for the climate and uh, the economy and uh, individual jobs and equality. So Dave, take it away. Uh, Karen, I don't have uh, much to add uh, except uh, just frame repeat your early frame that this is a really a good news story uh, that uh, while there are storm clouds uh, here in the US on, uh, at the national level in terms of the current administration's antipathy toward clean energy, um, the, the winds are blowing those, those clouds away led by the states uh, that, that have traditional authority and are exercising it. Uh, and with innovative ideas like the National Climate Bank, uh, there's no reason why uh, we can't accelerate uh, the, this transition that's essential for, uh, for the U.S., for the planet, uh, and, and, uh, and, uh, and have a better tomorrow. Thank you both. Bye. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you.